This is the Washington Week Webcast Extra. Hello and welcome to the Washington Week Webcast Extra. I'm Gwen Eiffel, joined around the table by Dan Baltz of the Washington Post, Kim Gattis of the BBC, and Peter Baker of the New York Times. The troubles around the world have led to an obvious yet unanswerable question. How far is or should the U.S. be willing to go to help? There are as many answers as there are experts, presidential candidates, and presidents. We're stepping up the pressure on ISIL where it lives, and we will not let up. Adjusting our tactics where necessary until they are beaten. If you ask French President Francois Hollande, the demand is for action, military and diplomatic, accelerated and immediate. But what is the U.S. actually considering, Peter, and what does this 65-member international coalition the president keeps talking about, what does that look like? Well, the 65-member uh, coalition looks like this. There's the United States, and then there's everybody else. <laughs> Basically, if you look at what's happening in Syria, 95% of the airstrikes have been conducted by the United States. In Iraq, it's been about two-thirds. We put together these numbers in order to say the world is behind us, but it includes, like, Lithuania, which arrests somebody. I remember somebody having the same Slovenia. conversation when George W. Exactly. Bush talked about the coalition of the willing. The coalition of the willing, which had 45, I think, is the number he used to throw around, something in that range. It really just means other nations are, you know, they might provide us a little intelligence, they might arrest a bad guy they uh, uh, catch coming through their borders. They're not really participants in what we would think of as a military coalition. That's really still the United States and a handful of other countries that actually uh, participate militarily. France now stepping up its part in that. Now, what does France want? France wants, uh, you know, more vigorous uh, application of this. It didn't bomb in Syria for the most part prior to the Paris attacks. Now it's bombing in Syria. But it's using targets that the United States has provided. It's using mid-air refueling the United States provided. It's using uh, uh, intelligence that the United States is providing. So it's still really a United States coalition. But what President Obama wants to emphasize is it's different than what Russia is up to. Because Russia, he says, has a two-nation coalition, meaning Russia and Iran. And he's trying to isolate them in the world. Do Americans, Dan, have the stomach for this idea of, of a heightened international intervention on our part? In the wake of the Paris attacks, there is a greater appetite for this than there has been uh, prior to that. Um, some of the polling shows significant support, not just for airstrikes, but for ground forces, um, which is a change from what we had seen, you know, coming out of Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, this kind of ebbs and flows. I, I think that the, the closer you get to a substantial, uh, the idea of a substantial number of ground forces, which really nobody is talking about except Lindsey Graham, um, the more people would react against that. But at this point, because people are afraid, they want a robust response. And Kim, on the campaign trail, we see Hillary Clinton trying to find a tightrope to walk between her history with the president and his incredibly, and uh, once again, increasing disapproval. How is she doing that? So far, Clinton's team feels that there is no strategic advantage to putting distance between her and the president because her messaging has been mostly focused on the economy and she praises his work on trying to uh, get an eco economic recovery uh, on the campaign trail, so does, so does her team. In the wake of the Paris attacks, she's going to have to watch very, very carefully what is the mood in the country mm -hmm. and how much do the president's disapproval ratings um, increase. At some point, she has to walk that fine line between continuing to approve of his economic, uh, of his work on the economy, and distancing herself from him on being more, with, by being more assertive on foreign policy without sounding too bellicose either, because she still needs to appeal to primary which democratic is why, voters. Which is why we call it a tightrope, exactly. Yes. <laughs> Before we go tonight, I want to ask you each a question for everybody who's about to get up from their computer from watching this and go out Christmas shopping or holiday shopping. Books. <laughs> You're all reading. What are you reading? I'm reading a non-fiction book, Philosophy for Life and Other Dangerous Situations <laughs> by Jules Evans. And it's fascinating. I was not a very good student uh, when it came to philosophy when I was uh, back in high school and at university. But it's a great, lively way to see how philosophy actually applies to your modern life. Uh, you know, being resilient, being stoic, enjoying life as an Epicurean. It's quite, it's quite nice. My, oh. other, my other recommendation, if I may, is Orhan Pamuk, A Strangeness in my mind. I think it's a great tale. I've just, I just bought it and it's, um, he's one of my favorite authors and it's a great tale about memory and identity. Adding and, to the list. And <laughs> a good, good. I'm glad I could uh, give a good recommendation. Dan? 
Uh, the book I most recently finished is not a new book. It came out a year ago. It's called 13 Days, Lawrence Wright's uh, account of what happened at Camp David. Mm -hmm. it, it's an incredibly well done book, not only for what happened at Camp David, but for the sweep of Middle East history and portraitures of uh, portraits of the char characters who were involved in it. Uh, I'm reading a non uh, fiction book called Finale by Thomas Mallon. Um, I, I had read last year Watergate. He does historical fiction. This is about Ronald Reagan, uh, oh. and it's it's a, he's a great writer. <laughs> Peter. Uh, I love the Wright book, as a matter of fact. I thought that was a great book. I've just finished John Meacham's new biography of George H.W. Bush, Destiny and Power. It got a lot of news, as we all know, recently because of what uh, Bush 41 had to say about some of Bush 43's advisors, particularly Dick Cheney and Donald Rumsfeld. But what's really the meat of the book is a portrait of a president we had come to not uh, like at one point, and now today history is treating much more kindly. And we look into his uh, presidency through the venue of his diaries, which haven't been exploited as, as well as John Meacham has done until now. And the interviews that he gave John Meacham over the course of uh, the last few years in retirement, when he clearly decided to be a little bit more candid. So it's a it's a really interesting book. I've just finished reading a book that's been out for a while called All the Light We Cannot See mm -hmm. by Anthony Doerr. And the best part about that book, reading it against the backdrop of us talking about going to war and fighting an amorphous enemy, is to read a novel about World War II where the lines were clear, where the enemy was clear, and how much different mm. things are now. It was an amazing time. Cool. We Go ahead. Finish. Going back to World War II, I mean, I just read 1945, The Year Zero uh, by Ian Burma. And, uh, you know, those were terrible times. It was clear, more clearly yeah. defined. But it does remind you that we have been through worse times we and we got over it. Hand to hand. Thank you, everybody. That's it for now. We'll see you the next time on the Washington Week Webcast Extra.